We'll start off with some quick introductions. We'll go down the list. Olivia, start off. Tell us a bit about who you are and your background. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Olivia Bokwe Curry. I lead political and con congressional affairs for Amazon Web Services, and I also lead our AI federal policy. Uh, hi, my name is Nicholas Olis. I'm a senior economist with the Center for Economic Studies in the business research area at the U.S. Census Bureau, and um, I've worked on um, some of Census's recent efforts to generate uh, some national statistics on, on technology adoption and AI adoption in the U.S. Hi, I'm Carol Corrado. I'm a senior policy scholar at the Center for Business and Public Policy at Georgetown. Uh, I previously worked at the uh, conference board and uh, also for the Federal Reserve. And um, my work involves uh, studying intangible capital, digital innovation, and the role of technology in driving productivity. And happy to be here today. Scott? I'm, I'm Scott Walston. I'm the president of the Technology Policy Institute, I'm also a senior fellow at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Um, I study antitrust and regulation and broadband and AI and um, the economics of all kinds of things. And also, apparently, I'm, I'm not trusted with my own microphone. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, we'll have to be open about sharing that. Um, Rather than go down the panel one by one, I'll, I'll keep people on their toes and start off with Carol, who's just put off, put her microphone down, and ask you, we've talked about all this awesome stuff that people can use artificial intelligence for, but a lot of people are not particularly using it. What kind of barriers, what can we do to encourage that? What are the, what's keeping them from that? Do you have opinions? Um, a, a few. Um, <laughs> first of all, I. I think there's been a groundswell of interest uh, in using AI since the release of ChatGPT in November 20 of 2022, a little over a year ago. And we found that, when I say we, the, the conference board found that in some surveys that it did um, in July and August, um, where they, um, they have a regular survey of workers and their attitudes towards work. Um, and they did a special one that asked whether workers used AI. And what they found was that among office workers, actually 56% of the people responded that they have used primarily generative AI in their work. Uh, among marketing professionals, the response was even higher, like close to 90%. Um, and there they use it for, or they use a mix of techniques. Um, so I, you know, this is organic actually, mm -hmm. because some follow-on questions revealed that most people just did this on their own. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, on work time, but you know, they educated themselves and applied these open source products that they found uh, available to them. So I found that absolutely stunning. Uh, again, I'm not saying 90% of workers. I'm saying 90% of people who work in marketing departments. Uh, I guess that shouldn't surprise us. Um, but, um, but the other thing is that they also, when asked about what hindered uh, them using it more or adopting it, uh, they also were really fearful of misinformation, which in the way, you know, Catherine explained it this morning, it's like they're more worried about the X than the, the black box that generates the, the Y. Mm. Um, and I, I could say more about that, but that's sort of what uh, I think, um, I'm surprised at just how much workers are uh, you know, embracing the technology. This is not the policy of the firms that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one thing that I think hasn't come up in our discussions today yet. And that's a very unusual in that typically we think about IT systems as being something that one that people must be forced to use and we have to incentivize it to use that. And this is a lot of organic use. Um, 
we did a similar survey before ChatGPT, and 66% of the people said they had not used or minimally used AI. But then when we asked them, well, what about this tool, this tool, this tool? 43% of those people said, oh, yeah, 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 I use that. Like, I, didn't, I didn't realize that that counted, you know, and so I think that we have a bit of a, a question about use and what does it mean to use. It's not a binary yes or no in terms of using. How do we measure use? Scott, do you have a, a thought about how we measure use? What does use mean? Um, not really. No. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I thought that was your, I thought that was a softball for Yeah, me. no, right. Um, so I, I, there are, there are going to be there are differences obviously there are differences between how companies um, use it and then how it changes the outputs um, and uh, those will each require different things. We've I'm going to sort of take the question and turn a little bit. I'm a, it's, I'll put myself in a little bit of a different position than I usually am. I usually want to talk about you know data and the research we're doing, um, and I'm also usually the annoying person who says, "Oh, anecdotes, not data." Um, but instead, I'm going to talk about what we're doing at TPI um, <laughs> with uh, with with AI and, and LLMs. So we um, built our own LLM um, for use in our organization. It's public. You can go to it right now, chat TPI. Dot org. Um, of course, it's not going to work now when you, when you try it. Um, <laughs> the knowledge of service attack right there, DDoS. <laughs> right. But, um, but the idea for it was uh, lots of the issues that we deal with in policy are kind of the same over and over again, even if there are sort of new incarnations of them. One that we're dealing with right now is net neutrality. We've been, I've, I've wrote my first thing on it in 2006. Um, it's just, it's horrible. Uh, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to ever write this stuff again? Um, and I could just ask something to base, you know, write something new based on everything I've ever written. Uh, and we started there. And now we have an LLM that it answers questions based only on documents from TPI. Uh, and so that's, you know, I think shows a couple of things. First, it's a, it's a new, it's a way that AI is changing the way you interact with any organization's website. Um, and we're now, we're doing this for some other organizations too. Um, second, you don't really need a lot of resources to do this. We did it with one part-time, our, uh, our, our senior uh, programmer. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's freed up time to do other things. Uh, and so you know, we, we can measure how, how we use it. We also can measure how many people outside use it. And also, um, I, mean, I, haven't, I haven't tracked how much time I've saved, but I do keep a list of all the things that I do with AI. Um, and it's, it's a long list, which <laughs> might say more about how, bad, you know, how poorly I used to manage my time or maybe still do, uh, but, um, but it's exciting. I'm fantasizing about loading my syllabus into your tool and, that, and having it answer questions there. Sorry, Nicholas, tell us more about measurement. Well, that's the kind of, that's the key question, right? Um, there's, and yeah, I hate to say this answer, but it again is going to, it depends, it depends. <laughs> right? Um, and so, you know, I think the first place you have to kind of start is, you know, um, how do we define use, right? So and <laughs> that's why they don't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, yeah, no, no, um, no, so the first question is how do, we, how do we define use, right? And so we can think about use as being kind of like a core process of the business, right? Or a core, you know, like a method or something that's really important to the business. But then, you know, from what we've seen and what we've, you know, when we've talked about this with the businesses themselves, um, we th seem to think that a lot of these businesses use AI sort of incidentally, right? Where they're not necessarily aware that they're using AI. And that's because a lot of times businesses will sort of outsource, you know, functions that are not part of the core process to other firms. So when they're looking to, for instance, hire somebody, they might not you know, go through this sort of internal process, but they might use like a job site like Indeed or something that then uses AI to sort of sift through resumes, use natural language processing to identify like the, the perfect candidates and then bring that person in. And so that's, Does you know, that but, yeah, so, so the business itself has, you know, no idea that AI is being used on this, on this particular task, but how do we measure that, right? And so like when they say, do you use AI in your business as a yes, no, the answer is always no. And so even within existing surveys at the census, and we've had multiple years, and we've asked many different types of questions over these years, um, we get a lot of variance in, in, in responses and adoption rates. And so, you know, just to sort of 
put a little kind of benchmark in people's minds, um, when we look at you know the national statistics of the number of firms in the U.S. that use AI, we get something between three and six percent, and so that percentage is going to vary considerably depending on what our definition of AI is, what specific applications we're talking about with AI, and whether or not we're uh, discussing specific processes or tasks on you know that may or may not use AI. So good, it depends answer. I sure wish we had some infrastructure in place that could help us use these tools. <laughs> Tell us about the role of, of organizations to help, help people use these tools. Yeah, so I think if you look at like cloud service providers, CSPs, it's easier for us to measure what our customers use. Like you can always see the amount of compute. You know, you don't want to monitor or you don't want to monitor your customers, but in terms of pricing or invoicing, you can see the, the amount of um, compute or storage that a customer is using or how often they use a certain offering, if it's AI or not, or legacy AI versus generative AI. So I think um, as a service provider, it's easier to have that measurement. Mm -hmm. um, I think most of generative AI, if not all, is going to be in the cloud. And so that is an easy way if you're a, a hyperscaler or if you're just a respected CSP cloud service provider, that's one way of offering these tools um, to run efficiently um, and scale this these tools across, you know, internationally, domestically, across large and small um, businesses, individuals, et cetera. So having the cloud and the scalability of the cloud is a really easy way to make sure that um, this technology is put into the hands of everyone. So we're going to put some technology into the hands of everyone. You know, nothing can go wrong there, right? Yeah. That's never that's never gone wrong. Um, do we need to be regulating this in any way? Uh, Carol, I know you have some thoughts there. Oh. We're, not supposed to We're not supposed to bounce it either. So. <laughs> that was his drop the mic moment. Okay. Um, yeah, I have I have some thoughts, and um, but I'm coming from uh, a, a certain perspective, uh, which let me just sort of state to begin with. Uh, which is, I don't think we should regulate the, this this AI technology any different than we would regulate humans doing the same thing. Um, so I think we have a pretty good idea of what's wrong and what's right, and uh, that's not unique to, to AI. Um, that's nice. Number two, um, just as uh, I commented on this sort of organic adoption of um, some AI tools by employees, um, one of the things that's happening sort of higher level in corporations, more at the C-suite level, uh, is, um, is the exploitation of what is really a subfield of AI called explainable AI. And why did this come about? Well, it came about organically, not because of some regulation, but because you have people in C-suites or managers who want to you harness this technology, but are used to being able to ask questions of the analysts who bring solutions to them. Like, how did you come about you know, choosing option A versus option B, let's just say? Um, so, you know, there are now sort of tools that can be embedded in traditional AI, <laughs> may I use that word, um, that, that are not very surprising. I mean, they can spit out what, fe you know, what features, you know, uh, of the model generated option A versus option B. They can do partial dependence plots. They can do counterfactuals. Um, and this helps in the storytelling of the of, of understanding just why a, per, a, a given prediction is made. I mean, and this just shouldn't be surprising. Um, I mean, I was a macro forecaster at the Fed for many years, and you never just said, oh, the CPI is going to be 3% next year, full stop, end of sentence. He always said, why? Um, and, and so that's what, what business decision makers want to know, and lo and behold, this kind of accountability uh, is being, you know, exploited through actually just variants of, of um, 
classic statistical tools, to tell you the truth. I was going to say that um, transparency on how AI outputs is, is, is something that you will see at senior levels, but we've seen at all levels of our customers. And so you can have something um, called model cards, service cards, which tells you a very lay, um, non-technical explanation of how the AI output was measured or delivered. And I think that's something that more you know, lay people, not necessarily business leaders, just everyday consumers want to know. And that was, um, I think that really is what, because you can get high level behind the scenes in the C-suite, you know, explanations, but for the everyday consumer that wants the explanation, that's when you really have to work to make sure it's um, available and something that's almost, um, not categorized, but something that's required for um, all AI models. Um, if I may ask you, I mean, I described it as like another layer, you know, between sort of the predictive technology and sort of what the user can consume. Mm -hmm. Is that? Uh, yeah. So um, like model cards and service cards are, very, are, are for the non-technical reader, yeah. if that makes sense. And just showing you how, like it's full transparency on how the AI got to that output. And, and again, if you read the business press or the policy analysis sort of literature, they're all saying we must demand transparency of this technology. And, you know, again, if you just think about it, it's like, oh, it's being built into it as we speak. Um, so. I think that while Scott's getting ready, I think that's interesting because you use the word parcel dependency plots, which didn't strike me as a layperson explanation. Yeah. I so we have to, no, no, yeah. we have to see, I mean, there's clearly some, you know, well, who, who it's. So uh, go ahead, sorry, Scott. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's also the question of what transparency means and what it is people really want to know when you get the answer. Sometimes I, I don't care how it made got to the answer, but I want to see its references. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we put a lot of effort into in, in ours, that it has citations. Um, I don't know what it did in its black box, um, but all that matters is that I can go and check what it did. Uh, and so I think there's some difference, and it depends on it depends on the application. Um, and when you when you asked about regulation, uh, the problem with with the regulations we've seen so far, I think, is that they focus mostly on the worst possible outcomes because we're all we've been trained for decades to catastrophize this. I mean, it's the plot of so many awesome movies. <laughs> um, <laughs> That um, it's hard for us to think rationally about it, um, and that's you know the the, um, the 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 executive order here, the AI Act in Europe, they're all focused on you know avoiding this um, you know the, the worst possible thing. I'm exaggerating, but uh, but it needs to be more nuanced than that, um, and you know including thinking about ways that it can be useful even within the government. I wrote a while ago about um, the possibility. Of, of, of generative AI LLMs creating uh, responses to government requests for comments. Uh, and you know, right now, they already get floods of uh, automatically created responses where somebody can go to a website and click a button and it sends it in. Eventually, they're going to have thousands of 20-page you know, LLM created. And then the, the government's going to need its own LLM, LLM to try to go through it, right? right? Um, so you, and you don't necessarily want to ban it. I also actually I did one of those um, with uh, used an LLM to create a response. We didn't submit it because it's not good enough yet. But, <laughs> For the record, um, he did not submit it. Right. <laughs> um, but I, I think we're not, we're not, there are lots of, so I mean, these are two separate things. There are different kinds of transparency, and you want to think about what is the important thing that the person, the user needs to know to trust the output. Um, and, uh, and and the other side, the other aspect of it is regulation, and I, I don't think we're thinking about the cost and benefits in a rational way yet. I think the cost and benefits is interesting because, as you note, we, news cycles run off of extremes, and you, you know we. I don't know. I hate to always pick on cars, but a lot of people are going to die in car wrecks today by human drivers, and it's not going to show up on page one. But I almost guarantee that if there's AI involved in any way, that's going to be top of the fold. Uh, on whatever disaster there is. And so it, it feeds to that cycle of either AI is going to solve all of our problems or AI, AI is the worst thing in the world and without any middle ground. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I agree. And, and part, part of the issue, I think, before any regulation can take place is that there's still like a very limited understanding of what AI does to the firm. And so like one of the immediate concerns, obviously, that's been getting a lot of press attention is, is that AI is going to replace jobs and lead to vast amounts of automation. And, and, and so we need to think about um, how, how workers in the future are going to get money and, you know, what are they going to do and substitution. And, and so um, in, in one of our surveys, we asked firms that, that adopted AI, how did this impact the workers? Um, did it lead to like hiring of more workers, letting go of more workers? What did, what did it do to the composition of workers in terms of production workers versus non-production workers? And how did it um, impact the skill level of the workers, the average skill level of the workers? Now, granted, all of these responses are self-reported, so you can kind of take it with a grain of salt. But for the vast majority of firms, 70% um, of firms responded that the adoption of AI led to no change in the composition of workers, like no change at all in, in, in the number of workers or in the change in the type of workers. If there was a change, it was much more likely that the change was going to be positive, that it led to more hiring. And so that's sort of goes in line with some of the production uh, productivity enhancements that AI has led to. And then, but the biggest change that we saw was in the skill composition of those workers that firms that did adopt AI, um, they trained their workers. And so they required like a, a somewhat, a slightly higher skill level than previously before they adopted AI. And so those are the sort of questions that I think we need to better understand before any sort of formal regulation can take place. Um, I think regulation has to be sector specific. So if we're talking about a national security regulation, that's going to be very different than labor and mm -hmm. employment. So one, um, you know, unlike the EUA Act, I think a lot of the things that we're seeing federally are very sector specific. And then secondly, yes, we want to, you know, the U.S. wants to be a world leader in technology, especially in AI, especially against our adversarial nations. So we do have to balance. But being a world leader doesn't mean we can't have regulation. You just need to have smart regulation that, you know, differentiates between low and high risk AI, differentiates between sectors. But speaking of firms, there's a Boston Consulting Group study last a few months ago where it talks about actually the group of consultants these are all you know Boston consult BCG is a great firm and they have really high you know level of workers and the group that actually uh, worked in conjunction with AI um, were the best performing so it's actually you know and then they were immediately laid off yeah <laughs> so it's actually like the human in the loop with the technology was seen to have the best output also there are studies that you know a workforce that doesn't have a very I don't want to say sophisticated, but more of a working class workforce that may not have a formal education, et cetera. Um, when that workforce uses AI, their productivity um, also increases and also gives them, can give more of a sense of worth and a sense of um, accomplishment, um, being able to upskill and reskill using the technology. So there's a lot of positives in the technology that we need to be, that we need to be aware of, and there's harm that we need to be mindful of, but it's just being sector specific in how we regulate. I mean, one of the things I too simplistically think of, though, is that when you think about a, if something in our economy, the price drops or it gets more useful, do you consume more or less of it? I mean, that it, that's just a core uh, shape of the of the curve. And what we're saying here, every, everything I've seen says increase productivity of workers, increase, uh, increase, you know, decrease cost, however you want to think about the inverse of that. That points towards increased consumption, doesn't it? I mean, that's the that's the crux of it. Um, I guess the other part of that is you, you touched on this when you talked about, I guess, the global uh, world of regulation. How do we deal with uh, regulation? Is a constraint, right? I mean, a constrained optimization can only perform as well as an unconstrained optimization. That's just a truism of optimization. So we're talking about putting some additional constraint on the U.S. versus other places. Is that going to work or is that going to lead towards getting left behind? I don't know if I would say it's additional. I definitely think the EU started earlier, but like unlike GDPR, for example, which is the EU's privacy law, it wasn't just given to us and said, here it is. Like mm -hmm. the EU, whether you agree with the EUA Act or not, there was multi many, two years, two plus years of dialogue before now they're in trilogues and, and going forward. So I would say that if you look at the UKI safety summit that happened at the beginning of last month, that was on a global stage as a way for 
countries, including the global south, to get together and find a commonality and a common ground in regulation. So I don't think that the U.S. will ever be behind in any way with regulation. I think it's 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 a much more collaborative approach. It's just making sure that the global south is also folded into that with the West. Very good here. Go ahead. Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that. I don't. I don't think of it as being behind in regulation. I. I don't. I mean, this. I'm not sure that this is a case where first mover is a great thing. Yeah. I'm happy to be behind um, Europe in in, yes. in this case. But in in terms of you know how regulation of AI could affect development of AI and firms here, I think that's a kind of a scary question because even to the extent that people believe that there are certain aspects of it that should be regulated, and you could make very good arguments for that. Um, what happens when Chinese firms aren't? Uh, I mean, we've seen how AI is becoming more important on the battlefield um, and you know, setting aside uh, productivity. Uh, and what happens if we're um, tying our own hands? Well, a potentially other side is, is not. Untied. And I don't know. T tough question. Let me switch slightly and talk about, we've had a theme of bias um, throughout and that comes up with every, uh, we didn't talk much about it, bias with manufacturing but um, I don't know. I'll take the I'll take the extreme position that I'm really excited about AI bias, because I deeply suspect that we've had massive bias in our society on many levels in many ways for years. That's happening behind closed doors. And when I see studies that point out some massive bias on some data that we trained with, machine didn't make that bias. Machine didn't <laughs> inject that racism or, or misogyny or whatever whatever our bias of choice is. Um, how do we get some benefits from from the bias that this AI adoption is going to show? You th you're saying like if AI has a bias, it kind of highlights the intrinsic bias that we already have. Uh -huh. And gives um, us a chance to work on it. Yeah. And I think that there's also been examples of like, I'll give an example of hiring. Like um, and it's a controversial issue whether or not to use AI for resume reviews, et cetera, and hiring. But, you know, there have been studies where the candidate's name can automatically have an implicit bias on the recruiter. Mm -hmm. And most of the time when AI is used, that bias is no longer there because that's probably not something that's going to be trained because a name isn't something that you're really even going to put into, put into input, the model, right? Yeah, into the model. So that's one way that a, a bias that could be held personally can be um, remedied through AI. But there could be, you know, there were studies of bias um, for women and people of deeper, uh, people of deeper skin tones. And then um, they compared those AI tools with AI tools that were um, uh, developed in China and the same uh, mismatches that were happening to Asian Pacific Islander uh, uh, people were not happening with AI tools in China. Because, I mean, of course, you're being trained with more of the images, et cetera. The person who's developing it probably also doesn't have that. So it is, it's, it's a good way to like highlight. And I think that really pushes people to make sure that we're d making sure that our um, developer pool is more diverse, mm -hmm. making sure we're democratizing access to AI education. It can no longer be in like Silicon Valley or four year universities, like making sure you're, you're hitting vocational schools and community colleges and inner cities and rural areas so that you're um, really increasing that diversity of training to assure that these implicit biases that you can kind of see in certain demographics um, can be eradicated. Well, I, I would just like to underscore everything that she just said and that, and that again, that there's sort of organic development of, um, of uh, well, let's just put it this way. In New York, um, they passed a law about um, transpire, uh, transparency in hiring using mm -hmm. um, AI or mm -hmm. whatever. So a leading talent development firm in New York City uh, goes, oh my God, what are we going to do because we use AI? Um, well, there, of course, not, not, not sooner was the ink dry on this uh, regulation that a, a startup popped up and said, we will build you a layer of tools that will explain just exactly how your model worked. Again, inserting that sort of explainability layer mm -hmm. uh, into what had been a predictive model solely. Um, and then I think it probably even you know, generated a report that was in compliance with the law that was passed. Uh, 
but it enhanced this fir this firm was so happy with it because they could go back to their customers and say just explain what skills you know were given higher you know high weight and making these reg recommendations had they done something different they might have come up with other people um, and it was this whole sort of counterfactual analysis that had allowed them to actually enhance their own services um, and it actually grew out of uh, an organic pop-up uh, that helped uh, uh, satisfy the requirements of the new law. So that push created the committee cool demand. Thing, and, yeah. mm -hmm. Interesting. That's what I thought was um, <clears throat> yeah, so first, just a couple of, of quick stories and ways that I've seen the bias in, in AI. One is we, we try to, I like to use Dolly, Dolly 3, play around with it like many people do, um, to create uh, images for our, like our podcast page. And, and, and so I found that if I ask it to create an image of a panel um, discussion, you have to say that it has to be diverse or else it'll make it all men. And no matter how hard I try, a woman will never be speaking in the image. It's always a man. And, and I know I'm not getting, doing a good job of, you know, showing that that's wrong. Um, but, um, <laughs> um, and the the other was that uh, I, for our, our annual um, Aspen conference, I, just for fun, I put into ChatGPT, these are all the t topics we want to cover. What would be a, um, you know, what would be a, a nice agenda? And it decided that every panel had to be about AI, every single one of them. So it had its own bias. It That's really good. wanted us to talk about AI. <laughs> um, but I want, I, I want to agree with you, Sam. I, I couldn't agree with you more about how, about how great, great is the wrong word, but how it's important that we see these in, um, in AI because then we can fix them. Um, and they aren't examples of why we shouldn't use AI for these things. It shows us where we need to work on them because we know from, from thousands of years of history that people are awful. Yeah. Um, and we don't want them making these decisions because at least we can fix the AI models. Yeah, we can, and I think the other thing is we can fix them at scale. When you, you fix it once and you can fix it everywhere as opposed to you know, going to every sort of closed room and, and, and trying to say, all right now, come on, let's, let's try to be a little less biased now. So, sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I'll, I'll just echo what Olivia mentioned that, um, you know, there's been a number of studies that have sort of highlighted the fact that um, using AI to sort of review, you know, like business loans, um, resume data, things like that has, has, has sort of, you know, negated a lot of the implicit biases that, that a lot of people have. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's you know, I, 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 I remember one of the discussions mentioned that um, people are very forgiving of AI. And so like they'll post kind of all of this, you know, anytime the AI sort of generates some crazy result, and, um, you know, people will automatically sort of like forgive. And then there's some iterative process to, to go and fix it and stuff. And there was a funny, I guess like not very funny, but um, sort of dark Twitter mm -hmm. remark about how, um, you know, it's like the Oppenheimer people are like th the amount of intellectual brain power that's trying to get AI to spit back like some racist or some transphobic or some sexist result back is 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 off the charts in the, in the sense that you know they can't they can't do it and so in some you know there's a lot of protection being built in which is which is great and um, and hopefully that continues so we're all you mentioned the transition from November of last year, I remember I was literally, in, you know, teaching a class on AI when all this happens, and I had to throw away all my slides when, <laughs> when all these things happen. So that's why you want to be an accounting professor and not a, not a technology professor. But to what degree do we need the whole world to know these things? Like, is this a, is learning about artificial intelligence? Is it the, reading, writing, arithmetic, and AI level? I mean, if we are going to have lay people using these tools, to what degree do we need to push? this knowledge out I think and I'm worried I think it's imperative that we teach as many people as we can about AI because people are I think you can look at I think what's happening with in terms of like policy and, and regulation kind of look at how we still don't have a privacy bill like I think the majority of people don't really understand what it means when you say accept all cookies <laughs> and like the fact that their information is whether they care or not I can't say but they should at least know what they're signing up for and the same thing when you want as many people involved in AI as possible in order to have the best data sets to pull from right like you want a diverse set of imagery when you're doing facial recognition or 
or healthcare or whatever we're going to use AI for, the more inputs we have from a diverse group, diverse regions, diverse demographics is going to make it the most valuable. Or so most the argument is add. the more they know, the more they're likely to share this information. I think the more they know, improve. the more comfortable they are to participate. Mm -hmm. And that, and you need to earn that trust for people to know that their information isn't going to be used mm -hmm. X places because AI has the power to end a lot of the world's largest problems. And if you know, we can't the, our most um, our most uh, vulnerable populations don't know about it or aren't trusting the use of it, then you know how are we right. really? Yeah. Yeah, so a, a pop-up that says "accept all cookies" is going to solve everything, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, if you decide that we have to teach AI, then we have, then we have to decide what we're not going to teach, right? Because people only have unlimited time. What should we already? Should we cut more arts from you know school mm -hmm. curriculum? But it can change the way that we teach other subjects. Um, so I, I don't remember if it was Avi Goldfarb or Shane Greenstein who, who made this point, but that you know maybe in, at some point instead of teaching coding of different languages, we teach quasi-coding, right? Mm -hmm. So that people sort of know the structure of what it looks so they can tell the LLM once they're really good enough to do it. Um, so I think it should, we should think about what it means for the way we teach uh, on in different subjects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea of algorithmic thinking versus exactly. to, to be a coder. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the worry that I have, though, is that this, this is a budget list request. Um, we, should we, I don't know, I, I see this with students going on the job market. It'd be really nice if you had 14 years of experience with mm -hmm. ChatGPT and you could program 12 languages and, you know, these, these unsolvable uh, laundry baskets of wish list. And I think we've just added an additional wish here without this budget point that, that Scott made that, that something's got to disappear here. But I also think it's what you know. Like, I think if you go to certain communities, they may not think they're technologists and can code, but the videos that they're making on TikTok that these kids are doing and the editing and the gaming that they're doing, like, they could, their minds are being um, trained for these arenas. It's just that, and again, I go back to d democratizing of education and upskilling and reskilling and making sure we're in certain communities and not traditional tech communities, because then you're going to expose a whole new workforce that are already doing the things that would lead to more traditional coding and things like that. And it's just having the exposure and letting them know that actually this really intense TikTok edit that you just did that you think you're just doing for fun could translate into something more lucrative and like yeah actually so what we need here is a recommendation engine for if i have five minutes to screw around what's the five minutes that would make me a marketable skill versus maybe yeah. a, a, a you know a, a hobby thing yeah i want to like open this up to make sure i'm not monopolizing things because i can do that but are there questions that people have thanks a lot uh, so i'm i'm an economist from the international monetary fund so I have a question on uh, kind of on firms. So if you look at Latin America again, so there are a lot of uh, very small firms, one to five between one to five people, employees, <laughs> and the majority of firms are like this. Is it a uh, constraint for these economies to to use AI or innovate? In, well, to use AI. And, and also innovate in this area. And another sec question is, are we in the world where all ma the majority of AI solutions will be provided by the largest uh, companies? Or can we see any promise in that we will have smaller firms that will be able to, to create these AI solutions? I think Nicholas can definitely handle the first part of that question. Um, yeah, no, that's um, that's a really great point, and 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 that's something that's always sort of surprising um, to people when when we talk about like the census too. That you know, uh, close to eighty percent of businesses in the U.S. have fewer than ten employees, and and that's where we also see sort of the lowest um, adoption rates amongst all the firms and the firm types. Um, so I'll you know I'll pre. Uh, the answer I'll give is that there, there are definitely, you know, barriers to entry. And so one of the, one of the things we sort of uncovered in, in one of our, in, in our surveys is this sort of idea of uh, digital hierarchies and, and, and technological hierarchies that are um, almost required before a firm can sort of effectively adopt and, and utilize and capitalize on, on, on AI. And so 
you know, um, we sort of went through sort of the, what are those foundations? So the first thing they need to do is they need to sort of record and capture all of their data in a digital in a digital way and then store it, right? And so um, that's sort of the first step. And so, you know, um, while we think of digital technologies as kind of being around for the last 30, 40 years and it being a, a general purpose technology, a GPT, there's still 20, 30, 40% of firms that don't collect any financial information, marketing information, production information, anything digitally, that everything's sort of done via um, handwritten notes or filing cabinets or, or what have you. So that's, you know, that's the first step. And so whether or not like the mom and pop laundromats need, you know, uh, a sort of digital interface to, to, to improve their business is, is debatable. But once you, once you have that digital foundation, you also need um, computing power. And so that's where you need to store that information. And so that's where the cloud comes in. And so that's where you can capitalize on all of these, um, you know, like the amount of computing power that's available today is, is higher than ever before. And so small businesses can scale and can utilize um, some of the computational, like un almost unlimited computational power that they require for their digital data. And then finally after that is whether or not they can utilize and effectively implement um, whatever sort of machine learning, machine vision, whatever um, technologies. And so there's a clear sort of pyramid scheme, like pyramid, when it, you know, where, where AI is sort of at the top and there's a very small percentage of firms that can effectively use that. And unfortunately, smaller firms are sort of left on the wayside because those barriers are so high. Um, what does give me hope, though, is, is you kind of see this sort of U pattern when you look at adoption rate by firm size, meaning that you know, like, so the lowest, you know, the lowest, um, what we've seen in, amongst firms is that firms that have, like, really, really tiny firms, one to four employees, they have slightly higher rates of adoption than, like, the firms six to ten and ten to nineteen and so forth. And so, and, you know, and then obviously when you get up to, like, the thousands of, of, of employees, then it, you know, it scales up and, 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 tech, and AI adoption is almost universal amongst the largest firms. And so there is some you know, there's some room for those really, really tiny firms that can utilize and, 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 and capitalize on those, um, you know, on those existing technologies from that, that are provided by other firms. Um, the second part of your question about providers, um, there are very few providers in the economy. I mean, we did run that question one year. It was, it was literally a, a margin of error. 0.5% of firms, right, are, are providing technologies. Um, the good news, though, is that um, you know we're starting to take um, we're starting to capture some administrative data from the IRS, and we're using some text mining algorithms, and we're identifying that the number of new startups that are you know that are that where AI is part of a you know a key description of their primary business service that they're providing that is that's taking off now, especially like in 2023, and and we think that's you know it's going it's largely due to the arrival of LLMs. And so I think that's going to change. And, and subsequently, because more firms are going to be able to offer AI services and AI products to other firms, then, um, you know, hopefully we'll see adoption um, sort of follow that. But I, I think it partly depends on what you mean by AI for that too, right? Because if it's an LLM, I mean, like I said, we built one and we're tiny. Um, and it's the, the, the processing power that we use to run it also pretty small. I mean, our bills from OpenAI, which is the underlying model, I mean, less than a hundred bucks a month. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, so that's one thing. If you're talking about an AI that has to interpret, you know, that does do image recognition and is, you know, trying to look for, for cancer in, I mean, those are, those are totally different and, and that's, those require massive amounts of power. Um, so it's different. Although even with the cheap LLMs, I'm sure Accenture is going to sell the IMF a $20 million system <laughs> um, and make $19.5 million profit on it. Um, but, uh, in, in terms of the number of providers, I mean, it does rely really on, like I said, the number of cloud providers. And there aren't a huge number, but there are enough that it's still pretty cheap. I mean, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google um, are competing like crazy. Then there's Oracle and others. I don't know what the right number is, but I'm not sure that there's a small number. Actually, to push back slightly what you said, the mom and top dry cleaner, if they take the dry cleaning to the person's house, do they use... Uh, Google Maps or ways to get there, but that didn't count, right? Uh. <laughs> that, that's the incidental versus you know core right. process question, right? And, and you know, and you're right. Like, so one of the surprising kind of stories that uh, anecdote that is, um, you know, so when we tested these questions, we 
one of the surprising sort of responses we got back was from a pest control company, right? And so you think, why would a pest control company use AI? Like, how is, you know, it's, a, it's in, in the Southeast. And so, um, but what we came to find out is that, you know, they moved to, they, we talked to them right in the middle of COVID and they moved everything to the cloud like one or two years ago. And so their operator was based, I think, in Texas and they operated predominantly in Georgia at the time. And then, um, you know, they use, uh, like they outsourced their, you know, uh, an employee monitoring system. And, and so they, you know, and so they're, and so they're scaling and they're utilizing it effectively. And it's a small mom and pop type of shop. And so, you know, there isn't dramatic barriers to do that, but you need to have like a pretty um, forward thinking, I think, uh, either founder or, or, or leader or, or somebody who's, who, who can sort of identify what those trends and, and how it can be used effectively. One way I think about that is kind of a long tail of AI. When we think about AI, we tend to think about these massive systems within an organization that cross all organizational barriers and do a bunch of stuff versus the, the other end of the tail, which is a tiny, tiny AI. And so you think about that distribution, there's a lot of value in that, in that long tail of AI use, especially when you nudge it, the whole tail up with LLM type uh, technology. Um, I'd also like to uh, make a, a comment about um, data uh, and policies that promote data sharing, um, which is usually done at an industry level, either voluntarily or through a, a consortium um, or, or perhaps even mandated by policy. Um, this is one of the, I mean, given that the, the, the models, the black boxes themselves are, um, uh, you know, available via open source. I mean, yes, uh, you, you, one tailors them. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, but for a given application, it's the data that, it's the, you, you need the relevant data to do your predictions, okay? Um, and it's not just going to be your customer base, of existing customer base if you want to expand or scale. It's, it's got to be um, um, new data. Um, and um, if there are ways to um, promote open data uh, in the, the private sector, they should be encouraged by policies and encouraged by regulation because that's the way you get efficient uh, that's where you promote innovation and you also promote adoption. And it doesn't have to be the, and that's talking about moving people who are inside the frontier to more towards the frontier. Um, so an example uh, is the open banking data that the open banking regulation in, in the UK, I might not have the right name there. Uh, but basically what the UK um, moved to do relatively recently, but it's at least five years ago, is to uh, make the companies that are in, that, that provide financial services to customers, uh, require them to share data. Um, so this then enabled more competition. You could have a fintech startup starting up, okay, offering some novel service, um, but their potential customers weren't were not locked into the existing banking sort of structure. Um, and I think this would, I mean, this is just a marvelous example of how, again, this was policy regulation, uh, mandating industry data sharing, um, and then, uh, the evaluations of this policy have been overwhelmingly positive that it has promoted um, you know, more fintech startups than otherwise would have been. That's a uh, great example of how regulation expands versus constraints. And so that completely counters my prior claim that you know, a constrained optimization performs worse. You've got a, a case where, and I'm sure we could twist the thinking around to where it's unconstrained. Right, right. But, but it has to do with the data. So mm -hmm. you want to promote data sharing. Uh, and you know you might be talking about a mom and pop firm, but if the if the operator has some brilliant idea about how to expand vertically or horizontally, um, 
if there was a way to get their hands on the right kind of data, they would be more able to compete effectively, which would be the idea. Um, I could say there's an example of data share industry, voluntary industry data sharing that's been here in the United States almost forever, it seems, uh, which is Carfax. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I won't explain it, everybody's nodding their heads. <laughs> uh, but just imagine what the world was like buying a used car before Carfax. I mean, it was the wild, wild west, and now it's very civilized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's really, really made, made a difference, benefited the whole industry. Um, and then, you know, credits, credit reporting is another one. But uh, We did a study about eight years ago that said that the industry that shared data the most was healthcare, which seems opposite, but once we dug into it, the people knew what they could share and what they couldn't share. Like everyone, everyone else kind of had this standoff, well, I'm not sure if I can share this data, so I'm not going to because I'm worried it's going to blow back. But with all the regulation in place in healthcare, they knew that they could or couldn't, and so it was, it was more defined. I think there was another, qu there were other questions. Though. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Juni Zhu, and I'm working here at the World Bank. So um, my question also related to what um, Carol just talked about, like for developing countries, do you think we should prioritize addressing the X or the, the black box? So it seems your answer more moving towards the X, like like who, what happens if we don't include the developing country data samples into the generative AI ecosystem in general, right? So, so there is, um, you know, like, um, almost like an intuitive way of like, at least include them first and let's see then what happens. Um, but then when we roll this kind of um, your data exchange, uh, this type of um, intervention out in developing countries, the biggest bottleneck is more of there is no business model out of serving these kind of, um, you know, minorities or, or, or the less advantaged people. Um, in terms of, um, you know, private sector driven solutions, um, perhaps due to their market size or their purchasing power, or it's just um, the, the, the capability or the quality is not there. So, so that sort of hinder the effectiveness of addressing a lot of this, um, how to include the X uh, into the, the, the model. So I was wondering if I want to push your, your, your answer to what's uh, a bit more of the, um, the extreme, then um, what kind of uh, low hanging fruit or a type of sectors that you already see actually is successful and, and maybe um, the, the, the gentleman Nicholas can also comment on, the, on that U curve that you mentioned, like for the firms that are super small and uh, less capable, are there any already demonstrated business model to include them? Thank you. If it's easy to say include the X, but it's much harder to do, I think is the, the crux here. Well, uh, uh, I'm not sure I uh, grasp all aspects of your question, um, but um, uh, in terms of developing countries, um, again, I mean, I think, you know, sharing banking data, um, I mean, customer banking data, consumer banking data, uh, is um, actually a policy that that many other countries other than the UK have have followed. I, I can't list them, but um, but the point is there could be a private sector solution then that serves that population. Well, yeah, I mean, um, or the government could mandate it. Could more, but uh, but that would then provide the service to those people through the availability of that data. Right. Right. Um, um, transportation, uh, which is often run by the government, mm -hmm. uh, is probably transportation infrastructure to the extent it needs developing. I think it's one of the prime targets for applications of, of AI. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's run by the government, then the government, you know, needs That's to. That's a lot of power to have the data, but I mean, um, contrary to Catherine's uh, really mm -hmm. 
uh, intriguing example about uh, the cell phones over the cobblestones in uh, Beacon Hill, you know, giving <laughs> the noisy, bad data points as to where there are potholes in, in Boston. Um, I think a clever, uh, a clever gov government could get around that um, and uh, increase services to underserved areas. Um, Based on driving around Boston, I thought my immediate reaction to that was that the model is yes, there are potholes. <laughs> like there's, there's, there's no ambiguity in that. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Billy again from Georgetown. Uh, hope this is a quick, quick question because I don't want to be that guy at the end of the day. <laughs> So I hope this can be answered in like 30 seconds. Um, two questions related to uh, regulation. One, how, how is it possible to uh, encourage uh, uh, firms to adopt industry standards and collaborate on industry standards versus relying on regulation? Uh, that's one question. The other is how, uh, how to counteract uh, you know, regulatory capture. Uh, the big firms, of course, uh, have have the power and, and the influence, and you know, um, lobbyists are humans too. They serve a useful purpose in educating. So, uh, what are your thoughts on those two things? Nobody's willing to bite. It seems a difficult problem to me that, uh, on the one hand, you've got. Uh, the, the need for this, uh, but the other hand, it's easy to do poorly and mess it up and make things far worse. And that's why, I, that's why I'm in academia and not, <laughs> not in policy. So that's my, my quick answer there. No, I, I, I know that I mean, there are people who have written histories and surveys of industry standards. And I think... Um, it is a neglected area of uh, innovation, to tell you the truth. Um, now, there's, I think, a well-known history of industry standards in, in telecom. Um, and, um, but um, there's, I mean, why, I mean, if you just think historically, why do we, why are all, screws and nuts and bolts. I mean, why are there these standard sizes? That's not a mandate from the government. That was people, uh, many firms who produce these, these, these gadgets uh, getting together and saying, you know, we've, we've got to have a set of standards and then we can have interlocking parts. Uh, so whenever, you know, you've got these sort of more complicated systems, uh, often the industry or the parties, you know, come together and um, uh, and voluntarily agree upon a standard. I I I can't speak with with any uh, authority on this because I'll, I just read it on the Uber cab over here. Um, <laughs> but in, in the <laughs> yeah, right. But in today's New York Times, I think um, I I um, couldn't help but notice that there was a headline on industry, you know, firms, firms uh, have agreed to get together to set standards for data, and then they're what? Um, and, and then it's a, a brief story of how some very large firms, including Walmart, um, among others, um, uh, are essentially calling for uh, like food label standards uh, on data that are that is used in AI models, uh, where it comes from, you know, who provided it, or, you know, um, and so you can see there's some people in a room right now saying, what do you know? What do we, you know, as both users and producers, uh, how how do we want to create metadata for these these training data sets? that are out there um, that are known to have problems, uh, perhaps not as severe as what Catherine talked about, but of that nature. Um, and um, I, I don't know where it's going to go, but you can read the article and uh, follow up. Um, but like I say, there's just a long history of these sorts of things happening. And here we have one. Again, there's this 
this, this, this symbiotic relationship between the algorithms and the data, and, um, and, and so people are, are realizing also that data sets get built over time, and, um, and somebody's trying to do something about it. So I think it's symbolic that we end on an it depends. I and mean, we've come up with, a, I think, a very, a very um, invisible hand argument on the one side. On the other hand, the analogy you gave, in 1906, Upton Sinclair wrote a book called The Jungle, which transformed the food industry because it showed what a mess that was. And because of that book, it led to you being able to open up food and see what the provenance of that food was. And so we have both the call for the invisible hand and an analogy to something where regulation was important. And maybe that's a good, it depends way to stop. Thank you panel for spending the time talking with us and thanks to everyone. And is there some sort of final moment? Yeah, I'll give a final moment. Okay, final moment. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to thank everyone for participating. It's been fantastic. Uh, particularly our co-organizers, Tim Stefano and Andrea Moranti and everyone at the World Bank and Georgetown who've helped put this on. Uh, I know it's been a lot of effort, so thank you very much. <laughs> We've had some uh, really brilliant speakers, really, really good. I've really enjoyed the whole day. And I'm particularly grateful to Professor Sam Ramsbottom, who uh, personally helped in finding many of these speakers. So this wouldn't have happened without Sam. So thank you very much, Sam. <laughs> So uh, just to summarize, I'm not sure I can do justice to all the things we've heard, but uh, at our last AI conference in May, we heard that uh, the AI revolution was being led by a few leading firms in rich countries. And today we've heard from some of these firms themselves on how they're actually using AI in their businesses. And we've heard you know, several uh, promising use cases around how the AI can help lead to portable and cheap MRI in the DRC in Africa, how it's helping retailers tailor product varieties to local demand, which is maybe distinct from other, other regions, how it can increase worker safety in manufacturing. I've heard many, many examples of how AI can lead to uh, productivity or even broader welfare gains. But I think one of the themes coming throughout, and we heard it again in the panel at the end, was about the, the need for big data on which to train AI, and how this data is unevenly available. It's often missing or fragmented. Um, you know, in manufacturing, we heard this puts a theoretical limit on the accuracy of, uh, of how, how useful AI can be. And then more importantly, we've heard uh, you know, how there's certain countries or, or groups of people, you know, poorer countries and, and poorer countries for which uh, missing data is particularly problematic. And it can lead to uh, you know, problems in terms of the accuracy of the predictions and potentially biases in AI. So I think uh, ensuring that AI benefits everyone, uh, all of society, and more firms and workers can gain, and more countries, I think is probably the key, the key, one of the key challenges. I think we've also heard about how many firms have started small with particular use cases, and how difficult it is to uh, go beyond that and go into broader like uh, systems change and reorganization. Um, you know, even for these leading firms that are at the front here we heard from today, even those are saying how hard it is to scale things up and transform your organization. Um, in re yeah, but I think this is key to realizing the, the main gains from AI. You know, it's, when, it's not the technology itself, we've heard that's just a tool. It's when you reorganize processes to take advantage of the tool, this is when you get all the gains. So uh, we heard in retail and manufacturing, you know, workers can benefit from AI, but they need to see the productivity gains of how it can help them you know, in their day jobs. And we also heard examples of how AI can help predictions of childhood illnesses in Africa, but you also need the supporting doctors and healthcare systems to be able to do something with those predictions. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and uh, I'd be delighted to welcome you all at our conference next year. Thank you very much.